1901, Hong Kong. Young Ku Wan, architect of the Guangzhou Uprising, sits teaching English on the second floor of his house. His two-year-old son bounces on his lap. It feels good to be home. Exile didn't suit him. His revolutionary partner, currently living in hiding, had warned him that he was in danger. That a price was on their heads. But not here. Not in Hong Kong. The British would protect him. He keeps a revolver on his desk, though. Just in case. There's a commotion on the stairs. Students look over their shoulders. The door bursts open. Gangsters enter, waving guns. Young throws his son on the floor. He lifts up a dictionary to shield himself and reaches for the revolver. His son screams. Pupils scramble out of the way. The gang leader fires. Young thumps face down on the desk. The assassins flee downstairs and disappear into the narrow alleys, excited to collect their bounty from Qing officials. Rebels die. That's the rule. And there was no greater rebel than Young Ku Wan. Well, there was one. The man's partner, Sun Yat-sen. Honolulu, Hawaii, 1879. Sun Yat-sen would have many names in his life. All Chinese men did then. He'd have his genealogical name, his baptism name, his courtesy name. But he would also have others. Names with false passports to back them up. Names he'd use in hiding. Because Sun was a dangerous man. The Qing were right to fear him. After all, he'd bring 2,000 years of imperial rule crashing down. But in 1879, he was just Sun Wen, a student in Hawaii. One of seven Chinese at his largely Hawaiian Anglican boarding school. He'd been born in southern China, the son of poor peasants, at a time when there was little opportunity for boys like him. His family were not scholars who could get him a government position. The stagnant economy promised no upward mobility. Instability ruled back home. The largest revolt in centuries, the Taiping Rebellion, had ended only two years before his birth. Ever since the British took Hong Kong in the Opium Wars, foreign countries were scrambling for larger and larger chunks of Chinese territory. Now, they were flooding the market with cheap manufactured goods, putting Chinese artisans out of work. Foreign steamships sailed up the rivers, bringing in goods and bringing out coal. Opium still ravaged the country. Imperial attempts at modernization inevitably failed due to mismanagement and corruption. Even when the government did adopt new technologies, like steamships, they had to finance them through foreign capital and hire foreign engineers. And yet the Qing government, a northern ethnic minority perceived as foreign occupiers, kept insisting on the supremacy of their culture and deciding there was no need for change. Many Chinese had gone overseas. In fact, Sun's own brother went to the Kingdom of Hawaii to work in the sugarcane fields and Sun saved up for a shop and ranch. Sun and his mother followed him. The schools were better, that was sure. At least they were for lucky kids with brothers who made enough to pay the tuition. Here, unlike his village school, he got an education that opened the world. He picked up English fast, so fast that he was soon writing for the school newspaper and received an award from the king. But that wasn't all. He learned about British and American legal systems, constitutional government, democracy, and Western history, with an emphasis on the American Revolution, Glorious Revolution, and unification of Germany and Italy. When he graduated, he moved on to college-level courses at a missionary school. Here, the curriculum was more specifically American, imbued with a particular brand of New World optimism and dogma of self-betterment. But it also exposed him to Protestantism. And when he came home one day, asking permission to be baptized, his brother figured enough was enough. He sent Soon home. But those years in Hawaii had changed the 17-year-old Soon. He now saw his village as backwards and superstitious, and tried to fix that by tearing down one of the gods at the local temple. The act got him banished, and there was only one place for him to go. Hong Kong, 1883. Hong Kong was something totally different from Honolulu. This was a true city, a little Victorian England in the middle of Asia. Technology, banking, modern transportation, clean streets, and massive buildings. The contrast between his poor village and this metropolis laid bare to him how foolish the Qing had been not to modernize. He was only 50 miles from home. 
The next few years were a blur. He enrolled in college, got married, his parents arranged it, and was baptized a Christian. Sun decided he wanted to help people, so he got a medical degree. But Hong Kong didn't recognize his degree. So he opened a pharmacy in Macau and later Guangzhou, earning a reputation for giving away free medicine. But medicine wasn't his only pursuit. He developed a group of friends in Hong Kong, middle-class professionals like him who loved to talk politics. Several had connections with anti-Qing societies, and they began talking openly about overthrowing the emperor and replacing him with a democracy, theoretically at first, then in specifics. The group became so notorious for their radical talk, people nicknamed them the Four Desperados. And as they talked, the century of humiliation marched on. The Qing lost Korea to the Japanese and Vietnam to France. Western countries were building railways through the country, with corridors along the tracks where Chinese law didn't apply. The Empress Dowager increasingly pulled strings of government. More Chinese territory got ceded to foreign control. Everyone from Germany to Italy to Belgium was taking a piece. But there was an undercurrent of hope. In 1884, he'd seen Hong Kong dock workers refuse to repair a French warship damaged while fighting Chinese forces. And he met men in Hong Kong who believed it was possible to reform the Qing state. He found their arguments persuasive and decided to offer his ideas directly to the government. In 1894, he traveled to Beijing, both to see the capital and to file a petition with his recommendations for reforming agriculture, opening free trade, and leveraging China's human skill. He tried to deliver the letter to a government official known as a champion of reform. The man refused to see him. This rejection incensed Sun, but it was more than that. The wealth he saw displayed in Beijing, the open corruption, drove every thought of reform from his mind. The ineffectual Qing must be overthrown. And he knew just where to start. Honolulu. Twenty men crowd into a two-story wooden house. Dr. Soon is there, along with his brother. They all know what this gathering is about. This is the first meeting of the Revived China Society, a secret revolutionary organization dedicated to overthrowing the Qing. I'm a doctor, says Soon. But before treating my patients, I must first cure my country. But to do that, he would need money. This overseas chapter will primarily be a fundraising organization. His brother had agreed to sell some of his property to help the fight. Could he count on these men? Turns out, he could. Some sold businesses. Others gave what they could or organized fundraising events. Soon's electric speeches began attracting crowds in Honolulu's Chinatown. There were 5,000 Chinese in Hawaii, he'd say. If each person gave him a dollar, that would be $5,000 towards the revolution. A few would give more than that, volunteering to come back and fight when the time came. It came sooner than anyone thought. China had fared badly in the Sino-Japanese War, suffering a series of embarrassing naval defeats that had once again exposed the corruption and incompetence of the Qing. The time was right. Three months after founding the revived China Society in Honolulu, soon returned to Hong Kong to establish its global headquarters. But this revived China society, disguised as a social club, was more than a fundraising group. Renewing contacts from his college years, he met up with Young Kuan, founder of a literary society that was, like his social club, actually a revolutionary group. Unlike Sun, Young had deep contacts in Hong Kong and with the anti-Qing secret societies that operated in southern China. He'd been cultivating them for a revolt and acquiring weapons for three years. Some of these secret societies were the infamous triads, who in their centuries of anti-Qing resistance frequently turned to organized crime. Soon, ever pragmatic, turned a blind eye. The two groups merged, appointing Young chairman of the revived China society and taking a pledge to expel the Qing, restore Chinese rule, and establish a federal republic. They greenlit the uprising. Sun's longtime friend, Liu Haodong, made them a flag to fight under a white sun on a blue sky. It was time to rise. With the war ending, thousands of discharged soldiers were milling around Guangzhou, also known as Canton. Angry, defeated, and frequently unpaid, they were joining triad groups and revolutionary societies in steady numbers. If Sun and his comrades could start an uprising, they reasoned the people would join them. 
They recruited 3,000 triads. When activated, they'd assemble in Hong Kong and catch a ferry to Guangzhou. Then, they'd break into units to hit their designated targets. Some would seize government offices or bottle up troops and police. Others would capture or kill local officials. Soon quietly moved to Guangzhou, presenting himself as a head of an agricultural society to explain the strange coming and goings. He set up a religious bookshop as a front. There were spiritual pamphlets out front and an arms cache in the back. Contacts in Hong Kong shipped him loads of revolvers hidden in barrels labeled cement. Triads surveilled government buildings and shadowed targets. And they chose a date, October 26th, a festival day where busy street celebrations could provide cover as the strike force got into position. It was an auspicious date, the ninth day of the ninth lunar month. Yet it would all go so wrong.